<laughs> that, that's like the least inspiring introduction that I've ever been given. It's like, uh, you know, we've, we've already heard the same material from other people, but uh, we haven't heard it in Kevin's voice, so let, let's do it again. Uh, actually, I'm really going to make an effort to tell you things that you won't have heard from the various other Spectrum Auction uh, talks, uh, even to the level of slides of my own, which are beloved by me, which have appeared in other talks. I will, uh, I'll leave out uh, from this particular one. Um, so, uh, so if you don't know how Spectrum Auctions work, then uh, bad news for you. I'm not going to tell you that much about the answer to that question. I'm really going to try to focus on the computational stuff. Uh, so let's dig in. And, uh, before we do, let me point out that uh, this is joint work with a couple of my students. Alex Frechette, uh, who has uh, been poached by Google, um, and uh, Neil Newman, who uh, so far has not yet been poached by Google and is uh, here with us today. So uh, thanks to both of them for their efforts. So the FCC is running a, an incentive auction. It's uh, the first auction ever to feature incentives uh, or, or <laughs> something. Um, and uh, basically, the idea of this is to sell um, more radio spectrum to um, telecom companies so that they can um, you know, make your phone work better, you, you know, get more bars on your phone, and download those videos you want to download on your commute. Uh, the problem is there you know, just isn't any more spectrum for them to sell. And so you know, for a while, they've just been selling unused spectrum, and it's been a great thing. They've been you know, improving the economy and uh, reducing the national debt and making everybody happier. But at some point, you run out of different colors of invisible light, and you have to do something else. So uh, what they're doing now is repurposing spectrum that was previously allocated to one purpose and uh, moving it over to another purpose. And in particular, uh, in the early days of radio spectrum, some really prime spectrum was given to broadcast TV because that was uh, almost the only thing that spectrum was being used for at the time. Uh, and now it turns out that not very many people watch uh, TV that's broadcast over the air. And a lot of people would like uh, their mobile phones to work better. And so there's kind of an opportunity to repurpose things. So uh, broadly speaking, the way the incentive auction is going to work is that Spectrum is going to be bought back from, um, from television broadcasters who are going to be paid to stop being broadcasters, to go off the air. And uh, it's then going to be repackaged and sold to, um, for other uses, uh, most likely uh, mobile phones. So um, this is a big deal. Uh, of course, we don't know how much money an auction is going to make until the auction happens. But indications are that it's going to make a lot of money. So um, the Congressional Budget Office is the, the branch of the US government whose job it is to make impartial um, determinations of how much uh, things are going to cost the government. And uh, their official ruling was that it was um, going to net between uh, 10 and $40 billion for the government. Um, that's, that's net. So the, the government has to spend money to, to buy, the, buy out the TV stations, and then it's going to turn around and repackage that spectrum and sell it off. And it's expected to be making uh, this kind of money. Um, I, from what I understand from Paul more recently, I, th I think that there are now some indications the numbers might even be getting bigger um, based on some um, sort of public estimates of, of the values of things. But, but it, it's clear that this is a, a, an enormous um, application of auction theory, albeit one that's going to happen only once uh, in the US. And it's coming up really soon. So um, in the uh, end of the first quarter next year, this is projected to happen. So uh, mark your calendars for March 29th and uh, you know, be prepared to see a, a real victory of uh, algorithmic game theory and practice um, start to lift off. So uh, I'm going to, as I said, say very little about how the auction works. So this is my only slide, really, about how the auction works, which is intended to give some scaffolding to those of you who might not have heard the many spectrum auction talks that have happened uh, at Simon's already. Um, but broadly speaking, there are going to be two different auctions happening. So there's going to be a so-called forward or ascending price auction uh, in which uh, spectrum is being sold off to uh, people who want to buy more spectrum, probably telecoms. And uh, prices in each region are going to be increasing as long as demand exceeds supply. Um, at the same time, there's going to be a reverse or descending price auction uh, for broadcasters, in which broadcasters are being offered money to um, buy out their uh, television stations and, uh, and free up this spectrum that is ultimately getting sold. Um, and uh, essentially, I'm going to speak only about this uh, reverse auction. The forward auction is pretty traditional at this point. This is uh, similar to what's been done in the past. And th there are a few wrinkles for this new auction design uh, in the forward auction. Uh, but first of all, not, not any that I've been particularly involved in. And secondly, um, the, the real innovation has happened on the reverse auction side, I think it's fair to say. So 
So in this case, um, you've got kind of a funny thing. I mean, many of you might be used to thinking about combinatorial auctions when you think about um, spectrum auctions. Here, what's combinatorial is the constraints, whereas the bidders are really simple. We have single-minded bidders, uh, at least uh, to a first-order approximation, where every bidder is a television station who is trying to decide, should I stop being a television station, or should, at least should I stop being a broadcast television station, or should I hold on to my station? And so they just have to make a, a yes or no decision. What's combinatorial is the decision that the auctioneer is making about which stations to buy out. Because uh, the auctioneer has a constraint that across the whole country, it wants to clear a certain amount of spectrum. And in order to do that, it doesn't want to buy out too many stations in one market. And it certainly has to make sure it doesn't buy out too few stations in another market. So uh, that's, um, that's where the kind of uh, combinatorial optimization is going to come in here. Um, now, in order to ensure that this auction makes money for the government rather than the reverse, uh, we need to ensure that uh, we don't end up um, paying a lot to clear a lot of spectrum and then not um, getting very much money to sell it. And so in order to ensure this, the two auctions are linked. And I'm not going to say much about that, but uh, there's a, a revenue target um, specified um, in legislation to say that the auction has to cover it, essentially cover its costs and cover the, the retuning costs associated with moving around the broadcasters who don't uh, get bought out. Um, and uh, so basically, if we haven't yet uh, achieved that amount of revenue, then uh, we, and, and the two auctions have both stopped, then what we can do is just um, say, you know, we, we were wrong about how much spectrum we were going to clear. We were originally running an auction where we were trying to buy out, you know, some, some particular amount of spectrum, uh, some particular number of TV channels. Let's just reduce that amount of spectrum that we're trying to buy out. Now, this will allow uh, us to uh, c continue running both auctions. So then we'll have um, less demand in the auction where we're buying and more supply in the auction where we're selling. And... Um, Maybe the other way around. But anyway, um, we, we can keep running things uh, so we can ensure that we have positive revenue. So uh, here's the thing that I am going to focus most of my time on today. Uh, this is the question of feasibility testing, uh, which is kind of inherent to the way that the auction works. So in this reverse auction, um, what's going on is you're a television station, and I'm going to come to you and say, um, you know, my, my starting price for your television station is $50 million. Would you like to um, relinquish your broadcast rights in exchange for $50 million? And uh, these numbers have been chosen to be deliberately really high. So the hope is very many TV stations are going to say, that sounds fantastic. Of course, my broadcast rights are worth $50 million to me. I can keep uh, you know, serving most of my customers on cable anyway. Um, I, I'd be happy to, to sell to you. And then we get an initial situation where there are a lot of broadcasters who have uh, agreed to go off the air. And in fact, there are many more than we need to meet the, the clearing target that we have, uh, which is lucky because these prices are, are astronomically high for the government to be paying. Uh, so then what, what happens is we start seeing whether we actually need each of the broadcasters. And if we don't need them, uh, which is to say uh, it, everything would be feasible if that broadcaster wasn't um, to go off the air, then we offer a lower price to that broadcaster, and we keep kind of iterating the round robin through the broadcasters until everything stabilizes, until basically we need everybody, uh, or until people uh, decide that they don't like the prices they're being offered and they decide to go back on the air and they stop participating in the auction. Uh, so from a strategic point of view, this is great. It's very simple because um, bidders are, making, uh, are being made a series of take it or leave it offers that are just descending in price. So uh, it's easy to see that bidders have a, a dominant strategy in this auction. Um, the, the computational problem, though, is figuring out whether we actually need the bidders. Um, that's the part that I'm worried about here. So what this means is every single time I want to go to any bidder, and there are um, 2,991 stations, so there are nearly 3,000 um, agents who might be participating in this auction, uh, depending on who makes these initial decisions to participate. I have to go to every one of them and say, um, would it be possible to not take this station? Uh, would it be possible for this station who's currently told me that he's willing to go off the air, would it be possible to put him back on the air given the reduced number of channels that I'm trying to make everything fit into? And asking that question is um, more or less a graph coloring problem. Uh, it's not quite a graph coloring problem because uh, we have side constraints. So it turns out uh, the way that uh, radio propagation works, if I'm on channel 17, uh, it might be that uh, you know, Costas, who broadcasts near me, also can't be on channel 17. But it might be that he's so close to me that he also can't be on channel 18. So we have these kind of adjacent color constraints in the graph coloring formulation. 
Um, but, but broadly speaking, it's kind of a graph coloring problem. And that's bad news, because even just as a straight up graph coloring problem, it's easy to see you know, that's NP complete. So uh, I, in principle, I'm going to have to solve many, many, many of these problems. And in, in simulations, it's on the order of about 100,000 problems per auction that need to be solved, because we're going to have to solve it once for every guy in the auction for every price tick. So every time I want to lower somebody's price, I have to ask this question. Um, and, and, uh, and the problem is enormous, and not just in the number of stations, but also in the number of constraints. Uh, sorry, I'll, let me just finish my sentence. So we have uh, almost 3 million interference constraints um, between all of these different stations. The reason the number is so high is that actually the, you know, Costas and I might interfere on channel 17, but oddly enough, we might actually not interfere on channel 26 because these are different frequencies. So they, the propagation characteristics are actually different. You know, their signal might be more absorbed by trees in one frequency than by in another. Uh, so I saw a couple of hands over here. Uh, so the, um, the constraint, uh, the coloring constraint, is it that you just have a number of colors? Is it just you trying to clear the same frequencies across the country? Or uh, maybe I have these frequencies in, on the East Coast, these different frequencies on the West Coast. Is it combinatorial, or is it just a number of colors that you have? Uh, the number of the colors that I have sounds combinatorial to me, so I'm not sure what the, the distinction yeah, is that you're asking. Is the same colors free uh, kind of throughout the graph, or is yes. it kind of a little more? Uh, more or less. I mean, there, there are the various places where something might be held out for some kind of complicated reason. I mean, anytime you dig into something practical, there's sort of irritating complexity that, that creeps in because of all sorts of special cases. So, but, but sort of to a first order approximation that, yes, we're, we're going to say, I want to take all of the TV uh, channels, which are now in between, I think it's 14 to 52, and I want to change that so it's 14 to 29. And so um, everybody who's uh, in any of those higher channels, they're going to have to get moved down, um, which is fine. I don't care where they go. But, uh, but you know, I'm going to have everybody who, who's willing to participate in the auction off the air. I'm going to have some people who weren't willing to be uh, uh, in the auction all on the air, and I'm already having to repack them. I'm having to assign them different channels than they used to have because I've gotten rid of some of their channels. And then when I'm going round robin trying to decide whether people's prices can lower, I have to ask, um, you know, is it possible to, I have this problem that's solvable for all the people who are currently on the air, is it also solvable when I add you? And I have to ask that for everybody. Yeah. Um, I think you said that you, you do this unilateral test. If I drop this station, am I still able to meet my slight constraint? Why is it unilateral rather than a set of stations that could all be simultaneously dropped? Um, well, because we can make these price uh, decrements one at a time. So I, I wanted to uh, change the price asynchronously. Oh, because you're well, you can sort of see, you can think of one kind of round of price lowerings as just you know, one pass round robin through all the stations. Got it. But the order does matter, because if I go to you first and you say I'm not going to accept your price, I'm going back on the air, that might change you know, whether it was possible to deal with Shadden or not. I got it, yeah. Yeah. If there's a station which still wants to be on the air, but it's the frequency at which it's operating is so off that it is going to cause problems, will you still be trying to get to some other uh, smaller frequency? Yes. Uh, so, so actually, Congress had to pass legislation to make this auction possible to happen for, for among other things, that reason. So um, stations who want nothing to do with this auction um, you know, don't have to give up their TV station, but they're not guaranteed that they're going to end up on the frequency that they're on now. So what they are guaranteed is that they're going to end up on a frequency that doesn't have uh, significant interference with other stations. And so that's, that's what all these constraints are. They're ensuring that everybody who's on the air is in you know, a decent place where they can reach the people that they're reaching now. Okay, um, so, uh, so initially, uh, when I first got involved in this project, uh, some skepticism was expressed to me about whether this problem could be attacked at the national scale. And uh, you know, people were thinking about things like, what if we just you know, look at some sub-area? What if, you know, when I'm trying to think about a given station, I look at some geographic radius around that station to try to make the problem smaller? And even then, it, it was a pretty challenging problem. Uh, that, that really doesn't work very well, and I think if you look at the, the graph of the United States uh, with the, the true constraints drawn on here, um, even though it's a bit small, you can see why that is. It's just really densely connected, particularly around here. And so um, just the constraints can propagate pretty far. Uh, and so making some kind of artificial restriction is just going to be cutting a lot of edges for no reason. You're going to take a lot of problems that might be feasible and making them be un infeasible. 
uh, something I should say that's really important is given that this, uh, you know, I'm trying to solve an NP complete problem here, you might wonder what happens if you just fail to solve it. You know, okay, Leighton Brown, you can make your, your fancy fast AI algorithms, but you're not going to change the, the laws of math. And so, you know, sometimes you're just not going to succeed in solving something. So something I think that's really cool about this auction design is that it's kind of robust to occasional failures. So what happens is um, every time we want to lower a price for somebody, we can only do that when we can prove that it's possible to put that person back on the air if they want to leave. If in the amount of time we have we're just unable to prove that, then we just have to act as though we've proven that it's not possible to put that person on the air, which means their price has to just freeze for all time at that level. And that's costly for us, but it's not a complete disaster. It only affects that one bidder. And the rest of the auction can proceed as it does. And so what that means is if once in a while we're unable to solve problems, that's going to have a kind of direct financial cost. I don't think I know an example of uh, solving uh, combinatorial optimization algorithms using heuristics where there's as direct a relationship between incrementally solving a few more problems and making huge amounts of money. But, uh, but nevertheless, you know, it, it sort of degrades very gradually with the number of problems that we can't solve. Yeah. Say you visit a bidder, you try to lower his price, you cannot uh, repack him, but you can also not prove that he's not repackable. Exactly. Then you visit this other guy who you repack or whatever. Then do you ever consider going back to the original guy in case the instance became easier or whatever? No, uh, for incentive reasons, right? We don't want to give people complicated incentive reasons where they might try to affect the hardness of the instance through something. And basically, if, you, if I ever make you an offer where... Uh, where I say, okay, your price is frozen, then if I want this thing to be uh, simple and strategy proof, I just leave it. So say you try to solve it, not commit that you are done, but sort of like that there is some room, they don't know the order in which you're... you're uh, so this is a more, more sophisticated question. Um, various designs of this form have been mooted. Uh, I think, um, I'm not actually sure what, what situation we're in relative to these rules. I think the the official party line right now is what I've told you. Yeah. The FCC back in the day used to be very worried about little, like seemingly little things like tie breaking and kind of the vagrancies of the way you do your computation affecting the outcome of the auction. What are the, like, how comfortable are the policymakers with what you just said, that the, the price dynamics somehow depend on the ability to solve the computational problem? I would be a fool if I tried to answer a question about how comfortable the policymakers felt about anything. Um, and so I won't. Um, I mean, there's been a lot of discussion about all sorts of you know, very fine details of this auction, as there should be, because you know, as all of you know from the practical you know, high-stakes auctions that have been held in the world, sometimes you know, getting some small detail wrong can matter a whole lot. And so I think there's been a lot of care given to those sorts of things. I think... The, the policymakers have expressed kind of you know, competing interests. They, they want to save as much money for the government as they can. You know, they want to be transparent and understandable to bidders. They want to have this thing happen on schedule. And so I think they're, they're weighing all of these sorts of concerns. Anyone else? All right. Yeah. How much time do you have to solve this? You say if you don't solve it in time, you move on. Sure, sure. Is it um, that's, that's a question under a active uh, discussion and consideration. I hear Paul Milgram laughing because he knows how much time I spend thinking about this question. Um, but uh, on the order of a minute, let's say. I mean, if, if we did fancy things like Costas is proposing, then maybe, maybe longer in the bad case instances. But if we, if we do what I've been saying now, then something like a minute. So is the TV station is waiting, is the station executive just waiting there for you to let them know in a minute? I think well, we would only do like a couple rounds of the auction per day. So there's only going to be, you know, on the order of a couple of price movements per day. So this, not, this auction is not like an auction for a Picasso at Christie's that, you know, everybody gets to go home in the evening and someone's got the painting. It's, this is going to unfold over a long period of time. But you, you, you run this one problem and you find out that you would offer this uh, station a lower price. And then, but you can't move on to the next station till you know what the station did, right? Right, so I think we, we have basically conditional uh, information from stations about how they would respond to the one movement if, if it were to come. Okay, so, um, so anyhow, um, my, my punchline here, as uh, you've been able to read in the last like, five or ten minutes on this slide, is that uh, you know, we're indeed able to solve these problems or else I, I wouldn't be here telling you about it. Um, I think part of the point of this talk is just to tell you about the 
you know, not the inner workings of all of these methods. I don't have time for that. But the kinds of methods that we use and the fact that they work, because I think that this sort of broad program for how to attack um, a hard comp computational problem uh, about which we know a lot in advance distributionally uh, is one that is uh, pretty bro broadly applicable outside this area. Yeah. How do you know so much distributionally? Where did you take your distributional information from? Well, uh, for one thing, I know that we don't have to run this auction in China. Right? I know, you know where all of the television stations are in the United States. That's huge. Right? I know this master constraint graph that everything is generated from. Secondly, I know the population distribution in the United States. And I know that the value of a TV station has a lot to do with the population that it serves. I know the signal strength of every TV station in the United States. And so along with the population and some geographical characteristics, you know, I can know something to a first order about valuations that tells me something about what would happen in an auction. I don't want to believe that too firmly. But you know, I can put some pretty big error bars on that and end up with a distribution. OK, so uh, let me start telling you um, some actual uh, answers from data. So uh, for the first, I'll, I'll tell you uh, two different sets of uh, data in this talk. Uh, the first one is uh, a set of data that the FCC uh, told me we're allowed to publicly release, and I think we'll be releasing soon, uh, which is at this point very out of date. Uh, it's, um, Inter uh, well, the interference data is already public, the set of constraints, um, which uh, is based on a clearing target of, uh, of trying to get everybody into 19 UHF channels. Um, and the, the data that I'm soon going to be able to release is this uh, results of some simulations, uh, which are based on the smooth ladder auction mechanism and um, valuation assumptions kind of along the lines that I was explaining to Eva. Um, turns out there's some complexity about, um, you know, if you're really old and you've ever watched broadcast TV, you might know that there's this one thing called UHF and this other thing called VHF. Uh, there aren't very many VHF channels, and so the repacking problem in VHF is pretty easy. So for this in entire talk, I'm just going to focus only on UHF problems, which are much harder computationally. Um, and uh, we did a sort of appropriate test training um, methodology here where we took all of these problems. Uh, we randomly pulled out 10,000 test instances and 1,000 validation instances, and we left everything else to train on. Uh, you'll understand better what I mean by training as I go on. And. Uh, as uh, I was, I was uh, saying to Ashish, we have a one-minute cutoff. So um, when I first got involved in this problem, um, there were a bunch of OR people already working on it. And being OR people, they, um, they like using mixed integer programming solvers. So that's what they were using. Uh, they'd actually thought quite a lot about generating fancy kinds of constraints and, and doing some relatively sophisticated things, which um, I actually don't have their code. And I'm not really at liberty to try to recreate it. Um, so what I've done here is um, maybe a little bit um, less good than what they did, but I, I think it's not really that different. What I've done here is just take off-the-shelf CPLEX and Garobi, which are the two kind of high-end um, mixed integer programming solvers, um, and I'm tr trying to solve them on our distribution. So, so let me walk you through what this graph means, because you're going to see a lot of graphs that look like this. So uh, on the x-axis here, I have uh, runtime, so th and, and it's on a log scale. So um, you know, this is a tenth of a second, and this is a second, and this is 60 seconds, which is my cutoff time. And on the y-axis, I have the fraction of instances that I've solved within that amount of time. So for example, you can see that within one second, CPLEX, which is the blue line, has solved a little bit more than 10% of the instances in our test set. And um, by the end, CPLEX has rallied and managed to solve about half of the instances, whereas Garobi is doing a, a bit less well. So this is pretty terrible, right? You would really hate to run an auction with a one-minute cutoff using these solvers because you know, half of the time, this isn't even half the stations, but half the time you ask the question, you're going to end up saying, sorry, I'm not able to tell whether that price can be lowered. I'm going to have to not lower it. People are going to end up, on average, with prices pretty close to the starting points, which are high on purpose so that they encourage participation. And the government is going to be bleeding money, and it would be a disaster. So, so that, that's why people were thinking that doing this at a national scale didn't seem like a good idea. This is on a laptop or on a supercomputer? Like, uh, th this is on a uh, high-end um, cluster computer. Uh, I mean, I'm running on one core. These are, these are all single core algorithms. But this is uh, on a, a cluster at UBC. If I were to continue for like, uh, I don't know, like 10 minutes, would I get 90% or would I get like, I don't know, 7 No. Well, I mean, you, you can kind of see, like, it, you know, th these curves tend to sort of flatten rather than suddenly becoming spectacular. It's on a log scale. You can sort of extrapolate in your head and see that within any kind of reasonable amount of time that, that would be consistent with running a couple auction rounds a day, you know, you're not going to suddenly be getting 90%. And, and even 90% is, is not, you know, all that could be wished for. Um, 
So uh, the, the first thing that uh, you know, struck me when I got involved in this is that it's a bit of a funny choice to be using mixed integer programming to try to solve this problem because the, there's nothing being maximized here. There are no real values in the constraints. Uh, it's a really a purely combinatorial decision problem. And uh, as a person in AI, if I think about a purely combinatorial decision problem, the most obvious thing to think about is a reduction to SAT. Uh, so that's what we did. Uh, I won't walk you through the reduction, but this is all very straightforward. Um, what I will point out um, most of all is that the, the reduction produces mostly clauses of length two. If you just kind of skim through these constraints that I've drawn here, you'll notice that most of the constraints are pairs of disjunctions, and only one of them is a disjunction of many variables. And that's a good thing for SAT solvers in practice, because um, I'm sure you all know that 2SAT is uh, easily solvable in polynomial time. And in practice, if I have a clause that is mostly um, two clauses, I can more or less search over the non-two clause part and then sort of propagate constraints through the two clauses and solve things pretty quickly. So uh, what actual sophisticated solvers do is a little bit more complicated than that, but it's a good intuition to have that the two clauses are, are kind of a good case for SAT solvers. Um, so every year there's a SAT competition where the SAT community uh, makes their best SAT solvers and, and puts them all head to head. Um, there's been amazing progress in the SAT community over the last few decades in incrementally improving these solvers. And um, not only are they doing a great job of making their solvers faster, but they're also making them publicly available through these competitions. So uh, it becomes possible to download a bunch of solvers and try them all. Um, we tried a large number of solvers, I, I think like a couple of dozen solvers. And the, the ones that I'm graphing here are just the best ones to avoid giving you a really cluttered graph. Um, but what we found is that uh, they, they pretty much dominate the mixed integer programming solvers for this problem. It really seemed to be a good idea to work with SAT solvers. Um, the best uh, SAT solver that we had is a DCCA, which is actually a local search algorithm. Uh, so it's not able to prove unsat at all. Um, but it turned out most of the problems in our uh, test set are satisfiable, so that was okay. Um, and uh, you know, the, even the worst one here is an algorithm called CLASP is doing about as well as our best, best mixed integer programming solver and lies above it most of the time. So on the whole, SAT really seemed to be doing pretty well. Uh, but even so, we're getting you know, uh, less than three quarters of the problem solved in a minute uh, using our best algorithm. That's still a lot less than we want in practice. Uh, oh, and, and here's, uh, uh, I'm putting underneath these uh, cumulative density functions a histogram of satisfiability status showing you um, whether the problems being solved were satisfiable or unsatisfiable. So, so in this uh, histogram, uh, I have th a blue area if the problem was sat, a red area if the problem was unsat, and a gray area if it times out. So of course, all the timeouts are over here. Uh, you might uh, be forgiven if you think that there isn't any red anywhere. Um, in fact, there is. It's always at the top. So you can see some little regions of red, but there's really not very much. It's kind of a side effect of the way the auction works, because once I encounter an unsatisfiable problem, that station gets frozen, and I stop seeing problems that have that station in it. And so I, I tend to spend most of my time in the, in the course of an actual auction generating satisfiable problems. Uh, so that's kind of good news, uh, for, in particular for things like DCCA um, that are satisfiable. And generally, in practice, it's faster to prove satisfiability than to prove unsatisfiability because you get to stop when you encounter a solution. Um, on the other hand, it's sort of discouraging because that means we might expect that a lot of this region is also satisfiable, which means that's money left on the table. Uh, so what do we do to make things better? Well, um, it turns out uh, a topic near and dear to my heart that uh, my research group has been focusing on for uh, more than a decade now uh, is something we call algorithm configuration. And the idea is to uh, think about um, the, the design of heuristic algorithms um, not as a process of human ingenuity and exploration, but instead as a process of combinatorial search. Really, in the end, you have these various different design decisions you could make in, uh, in designing a heuristic algorithm. And what we usually do, the kind of canonical approach, is that you, know, you have some intuition about what would work well, and you run some experiments, and you see how it does. And then you look at those experiments, and you think, maybe I should have changed something. And you change that thing, and you run another experiment. And you kind of iterate a few times until you get to the paper deadline, and then you, you send that to AAAI. Um, the, the problem with that is that that's a pretty lousy uh, search algorithm, right? I, I'm doing kind of coordinate descent. I'm changing only one thing at a time. It's very likely that these heuristics uh, impact on performance is correlated. It's likely that my starting point is not the best place to start. And, and I'm in this high dimensional combinatorial space. So it's really likely that there's just great stuff there that I never find. 
so what we've been working on is the design of algorithm configurators, which are uh, meta-algorithms in the sense that they're algorithms that take other algorithms as part of their input. So um, you give me a set of problems that you want good performance on, a way of measuring performance, and an algorithm with, which has many parameters. And these parameters could be absolutely anything. It's a black box. So you can use these parameters just to express all of the different heuristic ideas that you might have had. And then you kind of throw this thing on a computer cluster and wait for a few days. And it does this exp expl exploration for you. So it basically uh, draws on the statistics literature on experiment design and black box function optimization, uh, does some kind of clever machine learning on the inside, um, and in the end comes back with a configuration that it, it can show to statistical significance performs uh, better than anything else that it can find. And uh, so we, uh, it seemed like a really good uh, target application for algorithm configuration here because, as I was saying to Eva, we, we know that we're facing the U.S. constraint graph. We know, uh, you know a lot about the kinds of stations that we're facing. And so we really are happy to build something that kind of narrows in just on that part of the problem. Uh, we want to be careful that we don't overfit our training data. That's why we do this training test split, so that we're, we're sure that we do generalize within our distribution. Otherwise, though, this seems like a good thing to do. Um, in particular, uh, we used an algorithm that we call sequential model-based algorithm configuration, or SMAC. Um, and uh, the, the way that this works is that we build a response function in parameter space. So you can kind of imagine a space that has um, one dimension for every parameter and one more dimension, um, a response dimension for uh, runtime. And you can kind of picture in your head that there's some true underlying response surface that says, for every parameter, what's my average runtime in this distribution um, for, for that joint parameter setting? Uh, and then what we do is we use uh, random forests of regression trees, uh, which we've already heard a little bit about at this conference, um, to build this response surface in real time based on some initial exploration. We find a place that looks good in terms of that response surface, and then we go actually find out whether it is good. We conduct an experiment, which means we, we run the algorithm actually on those problems. We see how they do, and uh, if they look good, then great, but even if they look bad, that allows us to, um, to learn more about our response surface, and we just keep iterating until we run out of time, basically. Um, so, uh, so, so that's what we did. I'm happy to talk more about this if anyone's interested in it. Um, but the upshot is that um, we built um, a new solver called um, CLASP H2 for reasons that I won't tell you. Um, but but we, we built this new solver, which is just CLASP, um, but with different parameter settings. So something I didn't tell you before is that CLASP is actually an algorithm that was made by its creators specifically to work well in this paradigm of algorithm configuration. So they exposed many, many parameters that do all kinds of different things. And, and they really wanted to leave it up to people like me to, to just find things that are going to work well in their distribution. And so this algorithm, which actually started out as our worst algorithm, you might remember, uh, improves so much that it, uh, it's the green line up here. It becomes far better than the best thing we had seen before. And we're now at the point of solving about 85% of the problems. Um, th there's one more thing that I might do. I might ask, can the previous assignment be um, something you might notice about the way the auction works is I've always got a previous assignment, right? I'm always having a solvable problem and trying to add one station to a solvable problem. So one thing you might ask is, um, can I just add the station without changing anything? Uh, it turns out the FCC software already does that without even talking to me, and that solves 80% of the problems. So everything I'm talking about here is something that they gave me, which means that didn't work. But the next best thing that I might do is say, can it be augmented by fixing every station that doesn't neighbor the station that I'm interested in to its value in the previous solution and just solving this, the induced subproblem in the immediate neighborhood of the, the station that I've got? If I ended up proving that that was unsat, I would learn nothing because it might just be that I had to you know, make bigger changes in the graph as a whole. But that might be a really fast way of driving myself towards a sat solution. Um, so we built um, a, a sort of pre-solver that just tries this for a short time and sees if it works and then goes and tries to solve the real problem. And uh, we put that together with uh, this configured version of CLASP and we ended up getting um, this uh, performance that you see here. So here's, here's the configured CLASP and here's configured CLASP with the pre-solver and also some kind of software engineering trickery to make things faster. Um, and this was called a SATFC feasibility checker based on satisfiability 1.0, which was uh, released by the FCC uh, last November, so about a year ago. And uh, so that's th that. That was our kind of previous benchmark. Um, we we got written up in the in, in the press that cares about such things. Amazingly, you know, TVTechnology.com. I'm sure you all follow it, but 
but you know, if you don't, um, I, I, I was particularly happy here that he says, I doubt many individuals will have the time or resources to generate their own feasibility checks. It sucks up computer power. So you know, the people were clamoring for us to make this faster, literally coming to my door. OK, not literally. Um, but, but indeed, we, you know, we were still leaving a bunch of money on the table. So we really wanted to make this thing faster. And um, so we, we looked for some other things we could do to, make, to leverage the specific problem. One thing we can do is take local search solvers like DCCA and actually seed them with the, the previous solution rather than having them just work at random. That turns out to help a bit. Um, we've tried, incidentally, many things that I'm not telling you about because they didn't help. Uh, all of these things did help. Um, another thing we can do is we can take the induced constraint graph from a given problem and try to decompose it into uh, disconnected components. And if we find disconnected components, we can solve each of them separately. And for example, if I was to find that one component was unsat, then it doesn't matter if I can't even solve some other component. I've already shown that the whole problem is unsat. And one more thing that I can do is I can say, is there a station which is unconstrained in the sense that for every assignment of the other stations, it's always the case that this station can take some feasible value, maybe a different feasible value in every case. Uh, if I can prove that this fact is true about some station, then I can just emit this station from the problem, because I know that I could repair any solution that I found to fix this station. And uh, it turns out this can actually really help. Um, furthermore, if I do this first, I can end up getting more graph decomposition than if I, uh, if I didn't do this, because it involves dropping some stations. So I end up disconnecting my graph a bit. Um, so uh, looking at how much under-constrained station solving helps, um, here's uh, a CDF showing the degree of stations that we find in the real problems that we encounter. So we're seeing problems with up to um, station degrees of 60, so stations that interfere with 60 other stations that are really already on the air. Um, and, uh, and here I'm saying, um, uh, how often was I able to uh, detect and remove a, uh, a station as being under constrained? And we had an initial heuristic that we used, and then we ended up finding something fancier and better. So the initial heuristic that we used um, is able to get up to about 8%. And you see that it sort of tops out at, at stations with very low degree. We ended up with something much faster, faster based on our consistency that uh, gets us up above 45%. The reason I'm telling you about both of them is that the results I'm showing you right now are based on this green line. And the results that uh, I'll kind of gesture at at the end are based on the red line. <coughs> and the next thing that we did was uh, to build algorithm portfolios. So you know, just as a financial portfolio works by saying, let me exploit variance in the performance of different stocks by owning many stocks, um, we can do the same thing with algorithms for solving uh, hard computational problems. So it turns out that they tend to have very high variance in their runtimes, and that these variances are often uncorrelated. And so it can be a really good strategy not to run one algorithm, but to run many, even if you had to task swap them on the same processor, even if you're, you're not getting parallel computation for free. You can really gain something by running many things at the same time. And again, this is something my group has been working on for a long time. Um, we developed something called Sadzilla, which is uh, pictorially described in this, uh, this image here. Uh, and it's, it's been winning a lot of SAT competitions over the last kind of decade or so, uh, just basically by taking other people's SAT solvers, which I don't really understand, and putting them together with machine learning and making them out, outperform their constituent parts. So it really shows the power of this kind of machine learning approach uh, in combinatorial optimization. Um, another thing that we can do um, that, that uh, we've proposed a bit more recently is something we call Hydra, which basically says, what if I start with one highly parameterized solver, and I want to build a portfolio out of it? So I want to end up with a bunch of uncorrelated solvers that can be put together that perform well together, but my starting point is just this space that you have to search. You have to make these things yourself. So Hydra is a methodology for doing that. And that's actually what we did in the FCC problem. So we actually ran Hydra many times, um, both kind of configuring our existing solvers and, and choosing among them uh, to eventually find a set of things that worked well together. And I'm happy to tell you offline how Hydra works. Uh, but the upshot is we made a, a four algorithm portfolio. Uh, and, it, and so we we're going to run, uh, SATFC actually runs on four processors at the same time. And it, it looks like this. So we actually ended up, uh, we looked at you know, a couple dozen SAT solvers. But amazingly, we ended up choosing two CLASP variants, even though they're so similar. So CLASP really was powerful for our problem. Um, and we ended up uh, choosing a, a version of DCCA that uh, augments um, based on the previous solution. Uh, and we ended up um, building a, a pre-solver based on DCCA. And if we put all of these things together, run them in parallel, 
then, and, and we look at which thing solves first, then I get the performance of this maroon line, which is starting to look pretty good here. I'm now getting uh, pretty close to 100% of the problem solved, something like 98. So to understand this uh, graph, the, the set of instances you're looking at are, you simulate running the auction, like you simulate several auctions, and for each auction you get a lot of uh, soft problems. Right? Yeah. We're looking at the aggregates here. Yeah, so, so just to be clear, I, I then take that set of problems, I separate them into two sets, I do my algorithm configuration on a training set, and I evaluate the results on a held out test set. And what you're seeing in every picture I show you is test set results. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's held out from auction instance to instance, not from round to round? Um, so this is held out uh, just from instance to instance because the data set that I'm telling you about doesn't identify the auction that things came from. Uh, and at the very end of the talk, I'll show you some results that are held out auction by auction, which is, is obviously more interesting. Um, okay, um, so the last idea we have that I'm, I'm going to have to go through very quickly, uh, which is a shame because I think it's a, a really cool idea, is caching. So um, it turns out that you know, I really would be willing to leverage a huge amount of offline time if I could make my solver faster. And I know the constraint graph in advance. I know so I have this distributional information. You know, if I could somehow use this to, you know, run on a cluster forever and ever, I could save billions of dollars for the government. It seems like a good idea. The problem is I can't just solve every problem offline because there are two to the n possible problems, and n here is three thousand, and so I can't generate every possible uh, problem even in the U.S. constraint graph. Um, of course, all of these three thousand problems don't occur in practice. Um, because of you know, what I said about populations and uh, how that affects valuation and all of that and the way the auction rules actually work. Um, so I might hope that there's more structure to what happens really in practice. So maybe I should build a cache and just remember what I've actually seen in practice and see if I ever encounter it again in a different auction. Uh, and does that work? No. Uh, basically, I never see the same thing again, uh, almost never. Um, so we, we built a cache on a training set of 200,000 problems. We evaluated on a test, this test that I told you about of 10,000 problems. We were just never seeing the same thing again. So this idea was just not working. Um, but here's the, the insight that made things work. Um, if a station set is repackable, then every superset of that station set is also repackable. Right? If I can solve a given problem, um, then you know, I, I could drop some parts of that solution, and I would always still have a valid solution. So. Um, this is good because there are exponentially many supersets of a given set, so this dramatically increases my chance of getting a collision in my cache. Um, so uh, you might think I should you know, go to my cache and query to say, is there some superset I've ever seen before, and you know, use that as my cache. Uh, that's great. The problem is I need to find a way of querying this cache because there are now an exponential number of different keys that I want to be able to hit with a given query. So I need to find some querying algorithm that runs in real time where I can say, uh, you know, here's my query string. Do you have some superset of this query string in the database? Um, and um, basically, we've, we found a way of doing this where we build a, a traditional cache that we can hash into and a secondary cache that basically allows us to map uh, queries in the, in the uh, original queries into queries that are actually going to hit something. Um, I, I can't um, tell you exactly how it works, I think, in the time that I've got. Um, but it's, uh, it's kind of a, a cool randomized algorithm that, uh, that basically works by randomly ordering um, the, the different items in my secondary cache based on their um, sort of bit string representation under a random ordering of the bits, doing binary search, and then using the property that a, a superset is going to be ordered higher in the list. And if I have many different lists, uh, all according to different random orderings, then I hope that this prefix is going to be short in at least one of those lists, and I'm going to uh, find the thing I'm looking for quickly. Uh, if that was too quick for you, I'm happy to talk about this part offline. Um, but instead, uh, let me tell you how the cache actually did. So uh, on this original set of problems, the cache did spectacularly well. Uh, the cache is the dashed line here. I'm, I'm just putting it up against the portfolio I showed, showed you before. Um, this graph is saying, how, you know, how did the cache actually work? And it's saying there's a lot of stuff that you know, I never hit in the cache ever. There's a lot of stuff that I hit only one time. Some of it saves me almost no time, and some of it saves me enormous amounts of time. And then there, interestingly, there are also keys that I just hit over and over again. And again, some of them save me very little time, and some of them save me a lot of time. So uh, it seems like um, the, the, cache in, um, the, the cache really was working for us. Uh, in the end, we're solving 99% of the problems in a fifth of a second and 99.6% in 60 seconds. So we were pretty happy with these results. Um, the main thing uh, that we, and we, we released all of this as SATFC 2.0, um, uh, 
Um, the main thing that we uh, were concerned about with all of this is this is all about one data set. Um, so the, the last thing that I want to tell you about, I just want to put up some graphs uh, that are really hot off the press as of late last night of uh, a much newer simulation results. So um, the FCC has been generating data uh, in the last couple of weeks. So we have data that was generated on auction simulations between October 22nd and November 6th. So really recently, um, they generated 1.1 um, million instances in total. And all of these are instances that were not directly solvable uh, by augmenting the previous solution. Um, and, and this comes from 80 auctions. And all of these auctions are based on different simulation assumptions. I mean, the, the FCC didn't do this to make a data set for me. They did it because they want to test the effect of all kinds of crazy things that might happen in the auction. So these are you know, really a wide range of different kinds of assumptions, including assumptions about valuations, who decides to participate, how much spectrum we try to clear, and how long we run SATFC for, and how that affects the progress of the auction. So taking all of this stuff and kind of throwing it together, here's how SATFC does. So here I'm showing you 80 different CDFs on the same graph. And I've drawn dark the median CDF, median by its, uh, the point that it hits at the end here. So um, you can see that you know, overall, we're doing very well. And our, um, uh, again, I'll say we, we see the same pattern we saw before of mostly satisfiable problems. Um, if I look at the solved percentages, and I should say all of these experiments were done with the cache turned off, because that complicates the analysis. So the, the true performance would be better if we had the cache running. Um, but it, it's complicated, because I have to think about what we would train it on. Um, if I look at the solved percentages here drawn as a histogram, you can see that you know, most of the time we're solving um, you know, more than uh, sort of mid to high 90s percents of, uh, of instances. There are a couple of outliers that catch your eye in the other one where we're solving very few. Uh, luckily, those are really pathological cases that uh, where the FCC was trying things that they really don't expect would happen. Um, we haven't retrained on all this data yet. And we, we intend to you know, rerun algorithm configuration based on all this data. We imagine, again, that would only improve performance. This is trained only on the previous data set that I showed you. Um, the last thing I want to show you is we, we tried to test how the cache works. Um, and what's tricky here is that the FCC was not trying to make things easy for me. So uh, they often reran more or less the same auction with some very small change in it. And what I wanted to do is what David was kind of asking me about before, some kind of leave one out analysis where I, I leave out a complete auction, uh, I train the cache on everything else, and then I see how well the cache is doing on that auction. And I kind of try that everywhere, sort of cross-validate. The problem is that that gets complicated by the fact that two auctions are more or less the same auction. I end up sort of training on my test data, uh, testing on my training data. Um, so what we did here is an analysis where we took every auction and we, um, we looked at how similar they were in the sense of how many problems did they share in common. Uh, what fraction of the problems do they share in common? So um, density on this um, heat map is by what fraction they share in common from 0% to 100%. And we, we put a threshold at 20%. So we're coloring. It's the same um, luminance, but uh, the hue is red when it's above 20%, and it's blue when it's below. So Neil and I decided that 20% was a good threshold for saying anything that's above 20% is, is too similar. We're going to call it the same auction. And anything that is uh, below that, we think it's different enough. We're going to call it a different auction. So um, under that um, similarity measure, here's how the cache does. So, so what I'm looking at here is for each of the 80 auctions, I built a new cache uh, containing all of those auctions that weren't overly similar to it, uh, which of course sort of biases away from what the cache is good at. I'm, I'm trying to get problems that, where there would be few direct cache hits, um, and then um, see how, how well I do on these subset, uh, superset queries. Um, and what you see is, again, there are a few pathological outlying cases uh, where, where the uh, simulation assumptions were really different from everything else and we do very badly. And most of the time, uh, we're not doing quite as well as we were before in that previous case, which doesn't surprise me because we weren't doing a leave one out auction analysis. Uh, but our hit rate is still really high. So our median hit rate is uh, over here. It's about 40%. Uh, so Something like 40% of the problems that we encounter are uh, solvable just by looking at problems that we've solved before. And of course, we can make this better and better by just having a bigger and bigger cache. So we're obviously not going to stop here. We're going to do as much cache training as we can uh, before the auction really happens to try to push this curve up. Um, so I'll conclude there. Um, thank you for your attention, and I'm uh, happy to take questions. Um, so, the real auction that the real FCC will be running, 
Um, how do you know that there is no bugs in the code? Like, did you write the code? Did, are they rewriting your code? Are they trusting your code, or how are you trusting their code? As you can imagine, I've been asked this question before. Uh, <laughs> um, they're, uh, you know, they're doing many things to worry about this. I mean, uh, one thing that uh, you know, we're, we're helped by the fact that these problems are in NP, because uh, if I claim that a problem is unsolvable, there's no calamity that happens if I'm wrong, right? Claiming that a problem is unsolvable wrongly is like timing out on a problem. It's exactly like it. Um, and so that would be a shame, and you know, we, we don't think that we have those kinds of bugs. But if we did have those kinds of bugs, it's not terrible. If we encounter a case where I claim that a problem is satisfiable and I'm wrong, that would be really terrible because I could get the auction into a trajectory where I can no longer repack everybody and just awful things would happen and people would come kill me in my sleep. Uh, so, um, but luckily, we, we just had you know, three independent teams write different uh, code that is in the critical path that checks a claim of satisfiability and makes sure that it really is satisfiable because why not? It's really fast to do. Uh, so that, that we really do do for robustness. And then, of course, they just do all of this kind of enterprise software validation to protect it from you know, everything the U.S. government is concerned about. As you might imagine, after Obamacare, software quality has become a, a primary concern of the U.S. government. So I think they're, they're doing a pretty good job with, with just making sure that everything works. But the answer is that you wrote the software that they're going to run. Yes. They're going to run our software, yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>